Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite TV shows, movies, music, and more. We are your two NYC rock renaissance men. <laughs> I felt phoned in. I could have done a bunch of more lyrical references. Uh, I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtog. And today, Jordan, we are talking about one of the the turn-of-the-century masterpieces of modern rock and roll, a shot across the bow of new metal that helped usher in what we think of the L-Train-centric musical vibe of post-9-11 NYC, a dirtbag indie rock opus (laughs) that taught us all that rich kids could, with the right tunes and production, convincingly cosplay as legitimate scuzzbags if the songs were good enough. That's right. We're talking about The Strokes. Is this it? I love this record. I love this band. I love how much you love this record. Well, you know... For a long time, I thought I was, um, I labored under the delusion that I was unique, which sounds like an LCD sound system lyric, but I'm saying it seriously. I know, I can tell by your glasses you think you're unique. <laughs> For a long time, I held this album so dear as like, like a record that, and this was stupid of me. I'm fully admitting that I'm a stupid person <laughs> for thinking this. I was like, this record is speaking to me about how cool it is to be in New York and how cool it is to be a musician and play bars and hang out with your friends. And we did all those things together, though. Well, we did all those things together, but also, researching this episode, I realized that's what it did for literally everyone in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like that whole Brian Eno thing about only a thousand people bought the Velvet Underground record, but the thousand people that did started a 10,000 bands or whatever. That is so true for this record and and anyone within plus or minus five to ten years of our generation like i i you know we talked about a little bit on a previous episode we talked about mtv2 as like a channel mtv2 took over or or launched or whatever and it took over from the box like the request music video line and for like the first couple of months to a year of their launch they were broadcasting anything to fill airtime so you wouldn't just see current stuff you would see like i saw like the the beatles penny lane promotional clip you would see like the rage against the machine video from like 1992 you would see like primus you would see old ramones music videos and it was into this milieu that when i was 13 i saw the strokes video for last night Shot by Roman Coppola on a soundstage live, and I literally did not know what, where I thought it was an old music video. I literally thought it was Whoa. something from the seventies. I was like, that was the, the Family Feud style video, right? No, that's is that's la- that's um someday, oh, which yeah, is right, also right. very good because someday gave me oh I want to go hang out with a uh, slash in a bar, and that's what jump started my nascent trip to alcoholism. But, um. <laughs> The last night video where they're shooting it on a soundstage and it like literally looks like it was shot for like five dollars, like straight to video. It is live audio. You can hear when they knock. O- he knocks over the drum mic. Uh, you can hear his his uh, Fab's drum stick hit the cymbal stand. Like everything about that video, I was like, "Holy sh! What is this band from the seventies?" And I had no idea that they were a current band. And then my cousin Emily, who has been like my big cool older cousin she told me about tom waits she like lived in france and senegal and shanghai she when uh, i was like 13 or 14 she gave me a copy of is this it on cd and it was the international version so it had oh. new york city cops and it just, i was just hook line and sinker between the music video and the record i was like this is the coolest anyone has ever been or ever will be and this is all i want to do in my life is wear skinny jeans and retro t-shirts and get drunk in a bar and play in a rock and roll band and it ruined my life and nothing has ever <laughs> been the same since and f- full stop the strokes is this it episode over Jordan! <laughs> i said I mean- jokingly before the episode this entire i'm gonna record all my audio for this on an extremely hot mic like i'm june casablancos in 2000 <laughs> It's really interesting for me to hear all this, having gone through a lot of that with you over the last, like, five, six years yeah. playing in your band. I played bass in Heigl's band. 
You joined me like 10, 15 years into this journey. I did, yeah, and it never really occurred to me. Just in time for the alcoholism part. <laughs> and the death of music. <laughs> yeah, and the part where no one has any money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And right before the global pandemic shut down all venues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we sure came in at the right time. <laughs> So yeah, you know, and you know what? All the time we play together, we we've literally played like Mercury Lounge, and never I never talked about this band. Never, no. never talked about this band together. No, That's no, no. Because no. I, 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 it's weird to me. Like I never, I got into them like right as I was getting into punk rock, and for whatever reason, punk rock was so much more. Um, just became like my musical thing. Like I, I, I wouldn't say that anything that I do musically is really like I'm trying to be the Strokes. I just like. It was like, I love the songs and the songwriting, and I just love, like, that was, like, my image. That was just, like, the poster on my wall. Like, kids in the 70s grew up with, like, Thin Lizzy and Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and the Stones, and I was just, like, I had, like, the spin and Rolling Stone where it was, like, the strokes. Like, because I was into new metal, like, as an idiot in central Pennsylvania, and but but all those bands that I saw, like, you know, like, Limp Bizkit and Korn, like, they they tapped into that, like, hip-hop maximalist strain of like finances where it was like you know they were all comparing their watches on mtv cribs and they all dressed like um like all their videos look really expensive and stuff but the strokes were like the first band where i was like oh this looks like they could be like practicing down the street from me which is ironic because they were all very very rich and came to the music industry very rich <laughs> yeah exactly most of them were extremely better off than the guys in corn who grew up in f***ing Bakersfield, which is like a dusty, sunblasted hellscape, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's funny. I, I always, you have vaguely alluded to being a little bit more of a white stripes guy. Is that, is that, is that accurate? It was my Martin you, Short as, as Jiminy. Jiminy. You, you, you're, you're a little bit of a more accurate. white stripes guy. Is that correct? <laughs> I mean... Overall, yeah, but I think I, I discovered the Strokes first. Uh, I mean, as a guy, I've said this on many occasions on this show, I basically spent the 90s and early 2000s pretending like it was the 60s. So I, you know, at that time, I had no idea what was going on in pop culture at all. I mean, I definitely did not have my finger on the pulse of the music scene at the dawn of the 21st century. But I do remember the Strokes getting my attention because I was and am an extremely massive Beatles fan. Mm. So seeing a full-on band with guitars with like sort of a vaguely unified look like the Beatles <laughs> in Hamburg I was like this is thrilling this is I mean they were really to me the first group that fit that description that I remember seeing on MTV or hearing on the airwaves I mean part yeah. of that it was like you said new metal Limp Biscuit, or like teen pop stuff like the Backstreet Boys I don't know maybe Weezer I, I dimly remember them being around with the Buddy Holly video who in Corn was the quiet one did you know I interviewed Corn? Isn't that weird? They seem like they've gone through a lot of therapy and come out yeah. the other side as better people. Well, yeah, no, they were very nice, but it was I was I was very frightened nonetheless. <laughs> is that did they do that on the call? Is that the band that did the? Wah, I can't. I, there's no way I can do that. No, that's disturbed. Ooh, ah, ah, ah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, glad. I always I'm amazed you figured out what I was doing based on the cat cough that I just did. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah, no, disturb, that was down, disturb it down, the sickness, the, the, da -boom, da -boom, da -boom, da -boom. Right. that, that's from, uh, Freak on a Leash, that's a breakdown from Freak on a Leash. I love vocal tics, that's one of my favorite things, and I, I didn't realize with the strokes, when they were doing, um, all the little, like, sounds that you hear of him doing, like, off mic, like, in New York City Cops, when he's like, ah! <laughs> it's very Lou goes, Reed, you can tell well, he, he loves goes, Lou Reed. But he goes, he goes, he goes, ah! Uh, I didn't, I didn't mean to say that, I meant, oh! No, no, I didn't really mean that at all. That was all so f***ing funny to me. Like, everything about this band just hit me as just like, I was like, oh, you can be this like louche, kind of casual, like too cool for school guy. And it just hit me at the right time. I, it, it's, oh, I love it. Love it so much. Oh, take us there, Heigl. Let's dive in. Well, from the album's genesis in a literal Lower East Side basement under a methadone clinic, to the technical aspects of the band's retro future sounds, to the fistfights and drug addictions that followed, here is everything you didn't know about The Strokes, and is this it? It is impossible to talk about The Strokes without talking about New York. New York is a character in The Strokes story. 
<laughs> no, I mean, this is like if, if honestly, if like Manhattan and like Annie Hall are like the, the image of New York in a certain strain of generations, popular consciousness, is this it? It is like in other groups. I, you know, I swear. Uh, specifically, New York immediately pre 9 11. Uh, you know, 15, 20, whatever you want to time it out, years on from its nadir in the late 70s, the whole taxi driver era where you got punk rock, you got CBGBs, you got Son of Sam, all the stuff that people love about New York. <laughs> in the late 90s, <laughs> for all of its other virtues, the city was not a hot spot for rock and roll. Dance music coming from the dance days and sort of the and hip hop coming from kind of the heyday of the tunnel following the commercial dominance of Wu-Tang Clan coming in from Stat Island and the shiny suit, bad boy, puff daddy era of hip hop. That was the commercial uh, commercial dominant sound of New York. Rock and roll, meanwhile, had just come out of a phase of being dominated by sounds from the other side of the country. Through the 80s, it was hair metal. Um, really, the only East Coast hair metal band was like uh, Bon Jovi. Is that broadly well, accurate? Yeah, I don't know if I characterize them as hair metal. Glam metal? Ooh. Pop metal? Yeah. Shit metal? Ass metal? <laughs> I hate Bon Jovi. Um, so the 80s were hair metal, right? Sunset Strip, LA. Then the 90s, conventional wisdom is that grunge came in from the Pacific Northwest in a hail of flannel and, and, and stubble and killed hair metal dead. And then probably concurrently or a little later on, maybe a year or two, you had the SoCal pop punk ska people coming in from you have green day coming in from the east bay of uh, uh of the san francisco region and then you also had like the socal stuff as typified by let's say no doubt and so consequently alternative was not a new york centric thing at all says galaxy 500 and luna guitarist dean wareham in lizzie goodman's monumental tome meet me in the bathroom it's an incredible book done oral history style she talked to everyone uh it's it's a great book for anyone interested in this era of music we're uh, gonna quote from it a lot sorry lizzie um should have had you on uh but we don't we're not we don't do that we don't plan that <laughs> we far don't plan that far enough ahead jordan <laughs> by the 90s it was all about seattle bands were moving to seattle that is Gordon Raphael, who produced The Strokes' Modern Age EP that directly precedes Is This It? Then he produced Is This It? And then he produced uh, Room on Fire. He told Vice, in New York, it seemed like guitar music was on the way out. It was mostly house, jungle, drum and bass, hip hop. I remember an article in the New York Times celebrating the death of rock and roll, the old man. That was the feeling in town. In a different interview talking about the same thing, he recalls that New York Times feature having a cemetery headstone with a guitar carved in it. So that was presumably, that was that was the tenor of the times. And while there was a thriving punk metal scene at the time in places like Sea Squat and ABC No Rio, uh, those were bands like Nausea, like crust punk bands, and then a bunch of like, NYC hardcore bands like Life of Agony and Sheer Tear, these tough guy hardcore bands, they were not going to make it to TRL. So they were just not even in the mainstream conversation at all. And then, of course, you had CBGBs, who was also located on the Bowery in lower Manhattan. But CBGBs was honestly at this point kind of a diminished uh, consideration, at least as far as major label music was concerned. Did you ever make it there? Nope. Oh, I closed like the month after I moved to New York for school in 2006 and a bunch of my friends went like, I think it was the last night that it was in operation and they went to just kind of pay tribute as with, you know, I'm sure half of the 18 year olds who just moved there from the suburbs like me. Um, I didn't go because <laughs> uh, honestly, I think I was still fearful. You were afraid it, of a lot it, of things. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Um, and I, <laughs> I deeply regret it to this day. Honestly, I don't even know what I would have worn to that. Really, which I know shouldn't have been the biggest concern, but sure, I couldn't have worn an Argyle sweater to CBGB's on this last night. We recorded an EP with a guy who blamed Hilly and CBGB for tanking the New York City music scene because he realized that instead of, he said, he basically, his theory, which was kind of a sound one, it had legs, was that in the 70s and up in, into the 80s, up until the DJs took over, you had a, you had a band, a band would come into a club and the onus would be on the club to promote the gig the club would be like we have 
blah, 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 and the blue blahs there for five <laughs> nights. And the club would go out and promote all of it. And the band would just show up and play, you know, two sets a night. And that was it. And then Hilly kind of, Hilly Crystal, the guy who owned CBGBs, they would kind of flip the calculus where they would be like, okay, here's six bands that we shoved on to a single afternoon into evening show. And we're not going to promote it at all. And every band has to go out and flyer and do all the promotional work for us. I thought that was very interesting and also sad. Uh, well, now CBGB's is closed, and it's a yeah. John Varvatis store. And you can see the CBGB storefront in, I think, uh, Newark International Airport? Not the actual storefront. Real. No, yeah. they've, rec- they've recreated it. But anyway, uh, just one of many tears we'll shed this episode <laughs> for uh, an era of New York City that has uh, passed us passed by. Passed us by. Um, Part of this was that then mayor and now absolute insane person Rudy Giuliani hadn't quote unquote cleaned up the city yet. Parts of the Lower East Side were completely off limits if you didn't have a serious drug habit or a pistol. Uh, the various acronyms for Alphabet City, which is the part of Lower Manhattan east of the numbered avenues, were Avenue A, Alcohol or Adventurous, Avenue B, Bold, Blow, Avenue C, Crazy, Crack, and Avenue D, dead uh th- those being of course the terms for what you were looking for or what you were if you went there yeah that would have been helpful to know in my college years i'd never heard that very helpful uh series of acronyms <laughs> uh and also i remember getting to new york in the summer of 2006 and alphabet city at that time was still a place where you didn't go it's still so it's so weird to think back on a time when there were parts of manhattan that were like not okay to go to oh yeah because that's very yeah, much not the case anymore now there's like an apparel an american apparel well not anymore american apparel it's a trader joe's but yeah now it's a trader it's joe's uh like a lot of politicians giuliani uh side note Rudy. Uh, He basically got credit for plans that were put in place by his predecessors. Um, His big showpiece as mayor was the Disneyfication of Times Square. You know, so much so much pop culture that we take for granted nowadays sprung from Times Square being disgusting. I mean, that was like the grindhouse era of Times Square is where like, you know, we get like the Quentin Tarantino aesthetic of of modern shaft. yeah, it's Shaft, and it's like the Wu-Tang Clan went in there to see kung fu movies. and But um, the plan to clean up Times Square was in the works in the 1980s when state officials and then uh, Ed Koch, who was uh, then mayor, they used eminent domain to condemn and take control of a lot of the vacant, decrepit buildings, which coincidentally housed a lot of theater artists, musicians. Um, and then... The city council around that time instituted a study during the pre-Giuliani David Dinkins administrations that would allow them to pass rezoning laws if they could prove that there were uh, sex related businesses harming residential areas. So as a result, the city council drew up stricter zoning laws that prohibited sex oriented theaters, bookstores, massage parlors, dance clubs. All of that from operating within 500 feet of homes, houses of worships, schools or even one another. And that law passed in 1995, two years into Giuliani's term. So everything that Giuliani is credited for was basically, uh, t- except for 9-11, which <laughs> I can't prove he had anything to do with. I mean, here's a question for you. How do you define or quantify sex-oriented businesses harming homes and all the other things you just mentioned, places of worship, etc.? The stains. <laughs> Commercial break. <laughs> Last night. <laughs> um, but, you know, as you mentioned earlier, not a lot of this gentrification, urban renewal, whatever you want to call it, had trickled down into the East Village and Lower East Side. And even less of that trickled across the bridge into Williamsburg. Uh, Williamsburg in this era, even though it birthed bands like TV on the radio and, and uh, LCD sound system and LCD sound system might have been Lower East Side band, but... You know, popularly, we think of this whole NYC rock renaissance of the 2000s as being a province of the Lower East Side in Williamsburg. But at the time, that was very much not the case. There was a famous bar in Williamsburg around the time that I used to go to when it was called The Levee. And it was just then oh, yeah. like a metal dive bar. But back back in the day, 23 years ago, it was called Cokies. And they literally <laughs> sold Coke out of it. <laughs> you could just go and buy Coke out of their, coke, uh, their coat closet. 
Try and say that five times fast. You could buy Coke at Cokies out of their Coke closet. Um, <laughs> and they were never busted. Yeah. Question mark. Yeah. Wow. Is it weird that I've seen heroin a bunch of times, but I've never seen Coke? It yes. Makes me think my whole NYU experience must have been a total failure. Or maybe I just need richer friends. I, you're hanging out with a very specific crowd, if that was the outcome. Well, yeah, a bunch of screenwriters. Yeah, no, the filmmaking department are probably the ones you that had the coke. Hanging out with Jerry Saltz and, like, uh, William Burroughs wannabes. Why did you see so much heroin? That's alarming. Anyway, all of that said, the story of the Strokes begins not in disgusting Times Square, drug-ridden Alphabet City, or coke-slinging Williamsburg, but uptown. <laughs> Up. What's the Motown's it's the pop song? Uptown Funk? No. No, I'm thinking like that. Nah, whatever. I'm thinking about... There's a uh, Ronette song. Uptown Girl! That's what I was thinking of. Billy oh, Jones. That's, that's, that is yeah. not a Motown song. Nope. And I'm keeping that. Oh, hey, you Mr. son fucking... of a... Jordan! <laughs> now it's just turning into Jim Morrison. Earlier on... I was going to say, yeah, it sounds like Jim Morrison singing through a cell phone. I was going to say, we didn't get to your great quote about Julian Casablanca sounding like Jim Morrison singing through a Nokia flip phone, which I loved. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut that no, that's, off. That's okay, but that's... that's um, it was funnier coming from you. <laughs> Strokes bassist Nikolai Freitscher met Julian Casablanca at a bilingual French school on the Upper East Side, <laughs> which is either a setup to a Wes Anderson movie... <laughs> Or a joke about some of the worst people you've ever heard in your life. Uh, and they all met. Why the, can't it be both? <laughs> you sure can. And they all met the other members of the band at Dwight School on the Upper West Side. Or as someone puts it in Meet Me in the Bathroom, dumb white idiots getting high together. <laughs> you can't call your school the Dwight School and get away with it. Um, Paris Hilton went there. Mm. And so did Robert Moses. Terrible. You're like a th the yin and yang of New York City society. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it was always pretending to be a good school. Strokes drummer Fabrizio Moretti told Lizzie Goodman in the book Meet Me in the Bathroom, it's just a bunch of rich people. And the Strokes, as practically everybody knows by now, were in fact mostly a bunch of rich people. Lead singer Julian Fernando Casablancas was born in New York City in August of 1978 to John Casablancas, the founder of Elite Model Management, which for those of you not in the know about the ins and outs of New York City modeling management, was a big deal. Naomi Campbell, Cindy Crawford, Stephanie Seymour, Giselle, and Alexander Ambrosio. Yeah, big names. And his mom was 1965's Miss Denmark. <laughs> the hell of a pedigree. <laughs> Uh, Julian was sent to the Institute La Rose boarding school in Switzerland to improve his grade, <laughs> uh, his grades, to improve his grades when he was 13, uh, because he was just an underachieving delinquent. And that's where he met Strokes guitarist Albert Hammond Jr. I'm going to send you little brats to Switzerland. I can't believe he literally went to Switzerland. Uh, I think uh, Sean Lennon went to that same school. I'm pretty sure that they all met there. Uh, I know that Sean Lennon guested on Albert Hammond Jr.'s solo album, Yours to Keep, back in 2006. And I think that Albert Hammond Jr. also was on one of Sean Lennon's solo albums. Ah, uh, yeah, there's so. a, there's a, oh God, I didn't think to jot it down, but when I was doing this, Sean Lennon popped up in one of the, um, in one of these oral histories as having made like a crucial introduction in the band's history. They were like, oh yeah, Sean Lennon introduced us. Anyway, Albert Hammond Jr. is, of course, the son of singer-songwriter Albert Hammond, best known for his 1972 hit single, It Never Rains in Southern California. Jordan, what else has Albert Hammond Sr. written? He wrote One More Time for Whitney Houston, among other things that I don't know. And Albert Hammond Jr.'s mom was another model. So he had that going for him as well. And Beauty Queen. Uh, drummer Fabrizio Moretti's dad was a nuclear engineer. Um, and the, <laughs> rounding out the yeah the milieu of the high paying here, yeah. high paying jobs. Um, Nick Valenci, I wasn't able to track down exactly what his parents did. I found a 2018 interview with the Jewish focused online publication, The Tablet. He said his his dad was in the import export business. Uh, he said basically, I'm pretty sure that it was some illicit illegal. Sh um, out of the whole band, bassist Nikolai Freitcher seems to have been the only outlier. His dad was a security guard 
at the department store where he was once caught shoplifting a Luke Skywalker doll. Aww. I mean, if you're going to shoplift from anywhere, shoplift at a place where your dad's a security guard. At very least, he'll give you a head start. You can tell him then that you don't have to take your allowance this week and he can keep it as a bribe. Uh, Casablanca's Valencia. Disturbed with how quickly you came up with that. <laughs> Casablanca's Valencia and Moretti. They sound like a a, a very sexual law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Casablanca's Valencia and Moretti. How can we direct your call? <laughs> they started playing together as teenagers while attending Dwight School in Manhattan. They later added Fried Shirt, and in 1998, Albert Hammond Jr., who'd moved to New York after finishing school in L.A. The band played their first gig in September of 1999, which is a date that I want you all to keep in mind when you consider their rise to stardom. Uh, before the Strokes had anything else going for them, they had chemistry. We didn't play very well, and Albert didn't sound great. We didn't sound great, but there was a vibe there. Nick Valenci, who everyone agrees was far and away the best musician of the group, told Lizzie Goodman in Meet Me in the Bathroom. Um, I love Albert Hammond Jr. He seems like a very sweet man. I interviewed him once for People Magazine. Um, he was very, very cool and very low-key. Um, and But it is funny how everyone essentially shits on him when he first joined the band. They were like, oh, Al Albert couldn't play at all, but he he was cool. <laughs> but Nick Valencia, by contrast, had like learned a bunch of like Slash, Guns N' Roses solo. and was just like a shredding guitarist right off the bat. Wait, I um, had no idea that you interviewed Albert Hammond Jr. That's really cool. I'm glad you for, had you you got to talk to one of your heroes. That's great. It was for a solo record and I believe the launch of his sock and tie line. Oh. <laughs> oh. I bet you that wasn't part of your fantasy, was it? Nope. Sure wasn't. Uh anyway, just in terms of how Albert looked and how he played and how he fit in with the group, the dynamic was there from the get-go. One thing that I picked up on with these interviews is they talked about how they made sure to hang out in public, all four of them at once, for like that Beatles dynamic. They were like, oh, you guys are going to like, you know, 2A or the library or like this Lower East Side bar, like, we'll go too. We have to be seen as a group. And they would hand out flyers together. They mailed uh, postcards with like really like like hand drawn stuff and they 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 grew up in this you know the pre social media pre digital era of music promotion so that was a big thing they really benefited from actual like on the ground technically in bars uh networking um and they got some connections from Julian Casablanca's dad owning a modeling agency they would have <laughs> models occasionally show up to their shows which is helpful uh obviously but we did we didn't have that we didn't know we didn't have that we had fleming we had mario's parents we had fleming oh yeah we had chris fleming my friend yeah <laughs> um but still this didn't really help in their early days uh nick valenci recalled to pitchfork in 2013 we were playing to nobody every two week in new york uh he estimated in that interview the band did up to 100 shows with fewer than 100 people to which i say try doing it for five years you yachts <laughs> Splitting Best years four, of my life. Yeah. Sp splitting 40 bucks among five people. <laughs> well, it must be said that the band's look uh, also did them quite a few favors as well. Julian Casablancas later told GQ, when the Strokes first started playing gigs, instead of getting into a costume for the shows, we talked about how we should dress every day in real life like we're playing on stage. <laughs> Which, I mean, granted, was sort of how they were already dressing, because apparently the first time Albert Hammond Jr. showed up to play with the band, according to Nick Valencia, he was wearing a f***ing suit. We were all wearing jeans and t-shirts and New Balance sneakers, and Albert showed up in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I think they talked about it being at the Music Building, which is a big, giant industrial rehearsal space in, like, Midtown New York, where all of your favorite bands practice. Um and they all had day jobs at that point, so the practice was at like eleven thirty or midnight. And and Albert Hammond Jr. showed up, and everyone unanimously agreed that he had a fever that night, but he was still <laughs> wearing a suit for their for his first rehearsal with the band, which I love. And Julian Casablanca later said, "You know, if anything, Albert Hammond Jr. influenced the style of the band. He was nice, and he had cool taste." As you meditate on that. We'll be right back with more Too Much Information after these messages. Uh, 
unsurprisingly for a bunch of, you know, pretty tall, good looking guys. Again, and I, I just want to say I love the fact that the strokes are the New York City band that you could pick out of a lineup of every <laughs> other band of this era. I don't know if you could I like I couldn't look at the white stripes and be like, they're from Detroit, but I could look at the strokes and be like, oh, that band's from New York. <laughs> you know, that band has never seen west of the Susquehanna. What what is it? Is it is it just the 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 pasty white skin and the dark hair and the leather? Yeah, they all look like they don't go outdoors that much, and they're all like they all have cool tight leather jackets and disheveled dark hair. Not a not a blonde hair on a single one of them. Um, but they partied a lot. Let's just say, and they they made a lot of female fans. Uh, there was a band called Girl Harbor who once uh put a. a an image of Nick Valencia's naked butt on one of their show flyers because they'd opened the curtain at a show that they were playing and found him having sex with a girl on their drum riser. (laughs) And um, they just put that on their flyer and everyone talks about it in all the interviews. They're like, yeah, that was the flyer image for many, many years. Um, Now, was it before the show or after the show? I just hope it wasn't during. Or during, yeah. Uh, That's my next question. A small sampling of quotes from uh, Meet Me in the Bathroom about the band's pre-fame era. I'm sure they had better coke than I did. <laughs> they were naughty. Those guys knew each other before they even had sex for the first time. Which, if we're talking about Nick Valenci, was probably seven or something. He was f***ing 30-year-olds when he was seven. <laughs> They're characters. I think Albert put his balls in Nick's mouth. Albert loves to pull his balls out. We knew it was a fun party if Albert's balls came out at some point. And lastly, boyfriends didn't like the strokes. (laughs) I'm getting like slightly less problematic Matty Healy vibes from the strokes in this era. Circa 99, 2000. 100% they would not have made it through the modern social media era. There was an interview a couple of years back where Julian Casablancas gave to um, Vulture where he was... uh, just coming off as like the worst college freshman in the world. He was talking about having read um, Howard Zinn, like the people of history of the United States for like the first time. And um, the big thing that I remember was he was like yelling at the interviewer, not yelling, I shouldn't say that, but he was talking with the interviewer about um, how much he loves Ariel Pink, who I believe within a few years would be outed as a January 6th, like Trump troll. But um, Casablanca's position is that the only reason that Ariel Pink wasn't accepted as a genius in modern indie rock was that uh, was social conditioning and he kept comparing him to David Bowie and and the interviewer was like uh yeah man I don't I think the reason that David Bowie is considered David Bowie is because he was David Bowie and Ariel Pink is not David Bowie and Julian Casablancas was like it just everything you're saying sounds like a hundred percent social conditioning <laughs> see if I can find that interview I had no idea about Ariel Pink Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember if he was in... D- I think he might have been in D.C. I don't know if he was at the Capitol. Whoa. Yes. In conversation, Julian Casablancas in 2018. Oh, wait. Yeah, this is the quote. This is the... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe... I mean, you can talk about this. It, Julian Casablanca says, Everyone knows David Bowie now, but I bet he was pretty underground in the 70s. I think Ariel Pink will be one of the best remembered artists of this generation, and now nobody in the mainstream knows him. Well, that didn't pan out. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Bowie, I think, was smaller than we expect prior to, like, the Let's Dance era in, like, 83 yeah. when he really embraced MTV. Yeah, I think he was more of... I don't really know what the equivalent would be these days. I mean, I guess it, it, it's an apples to oranges comparison given the way that, you know... The music industry has evolved, so I guess there really is no modern comparison. But yeah, I think he was smaller than in terms of sales and in terms. Oh, of, I forgot uh, about this! Oh my what? god, I forgot about this exchange. Oh my god, I forgot about this. Julian Casablanca says, "Jimi Hendrix. People don't realize that it took years for him to get the acclaim that he has now. You look at the charts back then, and he was at number three hundred. He didn't have hits." And the interviewer says, "Jimi Hendrix was very popular during his lifetime." And Julian Casablanca says, no, you're seeing it through the review mirror. The interviewer says, but Electric Ladyland was a number one album. And Julian Casablanca says, I don't know. From what I've seen, I thought he never had any commercial success. And the interviewer says, he closed Woodstock. (laughs) (laughs) And Julian Casablanca just says, okay. 
It's a terrible interview, and my point is is that had this band come up in the era when people were constantly having uh, pressure to come up with sound bites, I don't think it would have worked out for them. Anyway, no. sorry, where were you? Yes, in this, this is this is the milieu, this cocaine and sex on stage and putting balls in your bandmates' <laughs> mouths and all the things that our band never got up to. Uh, this is the milieu in which the songs that would become This Is It start to coalesce. The first songs that really stand out are Last Night, of course, and The Modern Age, both of which Casablancas wrote under the thrall of Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. And before long, the band started to pick up steam in terms of both confidence and competence. That's a great sentence. You wrote that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Spinal Tap thing. They impressed me with their musicality, their confidence, and their punctuality. <laughs> And around the same time, Albert Hammond Jr., who, as you mentioned earlier, uh, needed a little help on the old six string there. Wasn't wasn't all that proficient. He wasn't all that competent, as you said. He met a guitar teacher named J.P. Bowersock at Richie's Guitar Shop in the East Village, and he became their guitar teacher, Albert's guitar teacher and Julian Casablanca's guitar teacher. And Bowersock, he talked to Lucy Goodman for Meet Me in the Bathroom, and he said, what Julian was mostly leaning on me for was that he wanted every note planned out, nothing left to chance. They were one of the first bands I knew that practiced in their rehearsals to a click track, which basically is a metronome, and not only once a week, but four or five nights a week. They were deadly serious about being super tight, so every note had to be worked out. Julian wanted to work out every note of the guitar solos, too. It's really interesting when you think about the band being this New York City rock icon because so much of their rhythmic feel comes from the idea that the drum should sound like a machine, not just in terms mm. of the pulse, but in terms of the actual sound of the drums, as we'll get to in a minute. But it's it's fascinating to me that they came, they did come out of this New York, um, they came out of this milieu of, of New York City being dominated musically by hip hop and dance music. Uh, and that they're credited with like this rock revolution thing, but they were like, they were like, oh, we got to play all these songs to a click and the drums have to sound like they're processed, which is like a thing that goes back to like ZZ Top records of being like, oh, we, we have a live drummer, but we want this to all sound like a drum machine, you know? Um, well, that's what I remember uh, Dave Grohl was being interviewed by. I think it was Pharrell and he was demonstrating his drumming on it might have been smells like teen spirit it was some big nirvana song and he was like no that's a that's a disco drum and he started playing it and singing whatever the nirvana song it was and then he started playing it and it was some huge disco track i forget which and it was the exact same drum passage yeah i love the the drums on this were on the record are, are, are so good also playing to a click is f***ing hard not, not just as yourself practicing your instrument but as a and getting four or five people's rhythmic feels locked together, that's nuts. Gordon Raphael, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, produced the band's first EP and their two full lanes, uh, told Vice, I went to a show at Luna Lounge in New York, and there were two new bands playing. The second band that played was The Strokes. Because I had my own studio and I was a relatively fresh producer, I had a business card and I approached them after the show. The first band, which I actually liked a little better, didn't call me. But Albert came to look at my studio. And as they're playing their music in the studio, I'm going, wait a minute, this is really good. I didn't get that feeling when I saw them live. But in the studio, it came together. They told me in very cryptic form what sound they wanted. Like, imagine taking a trip into the future and finding a band from the past that you've never heard before. What would that sound like? I sort of drew a blank on that. <laughs> I kind of love that description. I know it's kind of pretentious, but but I really enjoy that. I had a radio show in college, and it was kind of the same premise. Um, we leased our station airwaves from the UN, so it had to be, you know, in quotes, educational radio, which translated <laughs> to stuff that you couldn't hear anywhere else. So you, you had to play, like, really obscure stuff in order to not get in trouble with I don't know, the FCC or the UN or somebody that some big name we didn't want to piss off. And so I played super obscure oldies that were super, super catchy because I wanted to create the effect of an alternate universe top 40 show from the 60s. That's where Dick Duvet comes from, right? That's where Dick Duvet came from. Yeah, that's my DJ alter ego. Yeah, yeah. You, if you could go to www.dickduvet.com, you can see a lot of my old uh, old radio show um, recordings and playlists. Yeah, I could plug Dick Duvet there. Happy to. Anyway, the band had attempted to record before, and they'd shopped the results around to labels, but uh, it didn't pan out. 
Albert Hammond, I love this. He kept a small collection of rejection letters, some of which he framed and hung on his wall. <laughs> John Lennon used to do that, too. Apparently, when he was coming back from uh, his five-year period of semi-retirement in the 70s, where he was raising Sean. Again, all roads lead back to Sean Lennon in this uh, episode. Um, I, I, some label thought he was past it, and they sent him a note that was like, all right, John, quit messing around. $10,000 minimum guarantee for a beetle. And he just thought that was hysterical. And he framed that and put that on the wall. Anyway, uh, when the band arrived at the studio, producer Gordon Raphael told Pitchfork, Julian let me know up front that they never had good luck with recording and didn't like the process. Uh, and Raphael was admitted repeatedly over the years that he didn't really think that the band was anything special or on to anything. He said, when the Strokes first came to my studio, I thought, this is really cool music, and just shook my head and thought, sadly, they're about 20 years behind. Why were they doing that with their guitars? Everyone knew the guitars weren't cool. It's funny because, like, as much as they got this immediate backlash of being, like, rich kids and everything, a lot of people just talk about how hard they worked. Um, they were all really committed to it in terms of just the rehearsal and coming into the studio and hitting it really hard and playing live. And you can hear live bootlegs from the time, like, they were a really serious hard charging band even though they did kind of have this dissolute aura of being just dirtbags but the results of that session the modern age ep was picked up by the legendary uk indie label rough trade in the latter half of the year 2000 a year after they played their first show <laughs> by december following some local out of town touring the Strokes kick off a residency at the Lower East Side's famed The Mercury Lounge, which was pretty much a de rigueur hotspot for any of these bands that you all know and love now. The Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, Interpol, it was like with Arlene's Grocery, it was just like where everybody hit. And pretty much everybody interviewed remembers this residency that they did as just like the calm before the storm, like the high point of their, of their pre-fame career. We played there. That was the high point for us, our pre-fame career. I thought our high point was um, Elsewhere. I thought that was a good show. That was a good show. Yeah, that was a big... There were a lot of people there. That felt like at yeah. least like a couple hundred. <laughs> I think it was like 40. Oh. <laughs> Again, I believe a show for which we were paid like $40. We got good pictures. Despite that, filling the room. Yeah. I don't have figure. I didn't keep figures on our shows. Thank God. Yeah, Jordan, tell us about the Mercury Lounge. Yeah, Mercury Lounge, a uh, legendary Lower East Side venue, apparently has a, an interesting history. The building that houses it was once uh, the home to servants for the Astor Mansion, which was located not even that nearby, over on Fifth Avenue. And it was connected to this mansion by a underground labyrinth of tunnels. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I think your commute sucks. <laughs> Imagine walking under the Lower East Side to get Rat your tunnel. Yeah, clean your rich person toilet bowl. Um, I'm just really proud that I titled this next section "In It It In It It In It It In It It" because it's about the UK. It's about the Brits. Yeah, it's about the British people. The British people love the Strokes, especially at the time. That scans. It's kind of got a glam vibe. Oh, they just love. I mean, you know, they like they, the darkness. They, as much as you and a lot of other people are Anglophiles, the British music press are New Yorkophiles. Um, and the thanks to the strength of the Modern Age EP, which was released in January of 2001 by Rough Trade, and a big picture spread that was in NME, one of the big influential weekly music publications in the UK, the band basically sparked a bidding war for their debut record. Uh, again, like a year and change after they played their first show. Uh, NME put out the modern age, the song on a free CD sampler back when there were such things. By the time the Strokes hit the stage in the UK, they were already superstars. Leslie Lyons told Lizzie Goodman, the pictures were already all over the English press and their shows were backing up what people were seeing in the pictures. It's like the Mercury Lounge residency was a big bang and the particles just started spreading far and wide at an accelerated speed. They played a show in Camden on that tour and the band's UK publicist, Jacob Blackman, told Vice, they came on about 45 minutes late, and everyone was like, oh, they're just trying to be super cool New Yorkers. But actually, Julian was absolutely shitting himself. Of course, that was a super special show, and pretty much half the media in London turned out for it. At that stage, there weren't loads of celebs there. I remember the bloke who played Norman Cheers was there. George Wentz? Secret George Wentz. Stan? 
in in Camden. Uh, I wasn't able to verify that. <laughs> he continued, but the celebrities and the models followed very quickly. It wasn't long before Kate Moss and Sadie Frost and all that lot were begging to get into their dressing room. But Blackman continued, one of the things I really remember about that first tour was the fights. There was a fight almost every single day. There were a lot of jealous people. I was sitting next to Fab, the drummer, in the venue, and some guy made some comment like, you f***ing New York wankers. The next thing I knew, Fab had decked the guy. That happened all the time. <laughs> Whatever happened overseas, the band came back to the States, and they were pretty much immediately beset by label attention. Great quote from Nick Valenci. I don't know who was paying for the drugs. It wasn't me. <laughs> As it should be. Band manager at the time, Ryan Gentles, a guy who, uh, whose nickname was Weezer from everyone because he had horn rim glasses. <laughs> which is just like a kind of tragic thing that happens to you in high school and sticks with you your entire life. They said they ultimately went with RCA because they were the only label that would let the band own their record outright when they were done with it. Famously, they signed a five-album contract with RCA, resulting in at least two uh, contractual obligation records. <laughs> Looking at you, a record called Come Down Machine, possibly also Angles, another record that isn't very good. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about Is This It, which came together in March and April of 2001 with Gordon Raphael at Transport Terrom, was the name of his studio, in Alphabet City. On the Lower East Side, located again under a methadone clinic. Uh, but Raphael was actually the second producer on the scene. He told The Guardian in 2015, Julian took me to dinner and said Rough Trade wanted them to record an album with Gil Norton, who'd produced Pixies and Foo Fighters and sold six million copies of every recording he'd made. Julian said that if I told him I was a better producer, I could record the album. I couldn't do that. So he stood up and said, F you. Now we have to use Gil Norton. A few, a few weeks later, he called. It hadn't worked out with Gil. And Mark Ronson spoke to Lizzie Goodman for Meet Me in the Bathroom. And he had kind of a, uh, a tangential run in with the strokes. And Mark Ronson around this time in the late 90s and early 2000s was a, a, a huge hip hop DJ. Uh, he played at, uh, at the Tunnel, which was a very famous hip hop club. I believe he was the first. Uh, person to ever play hypnotize biggie's hypnotize in public you've mentioned that yeah i think yeah biggie gave him like a, a white label promo copy of it uh he had a, a small recording studio on second street between avenue a and b which was in the same studio where the strokes had just recorded and talking to lizzie goodman he said there were these jazz guys they had two other rooms in that same basement and they said i hope you're a little better neighbor than the last kids we had and i said who were they they said, this f***ing band, these kids, they were just pizza boxes everywhere, beer, their friends coming in, they're making massive amounts of noise. And I asked, what were they called? And he said, The Strokes. He sampled Someday. Mark Ronson? Yeah, the drum beat. Oh, for what? Rhyme Fest, the album Blue Collar, nope. song called Devil's Pie. That I mean you, anything to you? You made all those words up. <laughs> But these sessions for The Strokes may have been messy, but they weren't exactly fraught. Ryan Gentles, The Strokes' manager, says that he remembers watching a lot of mole rats in that basement studio. Uh, Gordon Raphael smoked a lot of weed, and Julian Casablancas wanted to go at like 16 hours at a time. And though it's often been reported that most of the songs on the record are first takes, Raphael told NME that that wasn't true. Instead, much of the drama came down to Julian Casablancas' Gnostic explanations for music production. I love this. Ryan Gentles told Lizzie Goodman, Gordon is such a great interpreter of musicians. Julian won't say, that hi-hat is too trebly. Turn the bass up or the treble down. He'll say, I need the hi-hat to sound like the rich guy who hangs out at the party and doesn't talk to girls, waits for them to come and talk to him. Or, it's too much like the way a sleeping bum smells on a Friday night when he's had too much booze. I don't want it to smell like that. Gussy it up and shave him. That's the snare drum sound I want. I want to do a quick sidebar on inarticulate musicians who made producers want to tear their hair out and or strangle them. Uh, when the Beatles were recording Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite on Sgt. Pepper, George Martin, the Beatles producer, recalled this bit of direction from the song's composer, John Lennon. He'd make whooshing sounds and try to <laughs> describe... 
<laughs> That's the best part. And try to describe what only he could hear in his head, saying that he wanted the song to, quote, sounds like an orange. Yep. That's acid for you. Yeah. Tom Waits would do that a lot. I think he I think he once said that uh he told the I think he told the bassist to play like your hair's on fire or something Ooh, like that. I like okay, that I that that actually like is instructive though. <laughs> I, f- I feel at least. As your bassist. As a high strung. <laughs> I never yeah. told you that. You never told me that, but it was implied. <laughs> uh and Brian Wilson, another one of my heroes, was a little more together in the studio, but he would say things like, I want the strings to sound like they're crying, or I want the percussion to sound like jewelry. This record was pretty bare bones, honestly, for becoming such a huge tome and uh for, for MIC indie rock, but and, you know, a lot of people would say, like, of course it sounds like it was made in a basement. It sounds like the whole thing was made in the trunk of a car. But, you know, whatever, man. People pay a, a load of money to get that sound these days. But no, this was actually just done in a basement. 20 grand this record cost. Wow. Which is you, nothing. Your for records an cost that. Uh, no, they come in less than that. But oh, for, really? a major la- for a major label record, yeah. uh, back in the day, I mean, Santana Supernatural cost into the millions oh um, I'm sure yeah i, I mean, think uh that was the record where clive davis was like flying in people to work on like engineers to work on like 24-hour shifts so that no one would ever not be working on it um none of the songs used more than 11 tracks which is so interesting because you that meant you know if you think of in terms of studio technology the way things have progressed in the in this the last century of recorded music from four track to Eight track to sixteen track to twenty four track. None of the songs on this record use more than eleven tracks. Um, accounts differ whether they used three or four drum mics, <laughs> plus one mic in the room, and then they close mic'd all the amps, obviously. But you know, th- to get that drum sound, uh, Raphael had come in from like industrial electronic music, so he put a lot of distortion pedals on the drums. He's like rat guitar pedal uh, that's an actual model of guitar pedal the proco rat um to try and blow stuff out and they would even uh, at some point rearrange the drum set for better separation which is an interesting technique that goes back to joy division uh when joy division was recording unknown pleasures martin hannett made uh steven what's that guy's name morris steven morris Yes, when Joy Division was recording Unknown Pleasures, uh, Martin Hanna, the producer, made Stephen Morris record the drum parts individually uh, to a click. So that meant not record by yourself. That meant record literally each drum separately. So he talks about having to keep time on his like thigh while he played just the tom part, just the floor tom part, just the snare part, and the way that by recording them separately, they could achieve maximum separation. But... What Gordon Raphael and Fab Moretti did was, and he said this was Fab's idea. He said, maybe if I put the hi-hat four feet away from the snare mic, I can play the hi-hat with another hand and still keep time, but there won't be any bleed. So he literally rearranged the drum set so that he could play the hi-hat with more uh, separation. Uh, And that was how they got this um, sound of the whole kit being played live but still achieved that separation of the sounds. There's another great quote he talks about for making room on fire. And I didn't include this in here, but I just want to, I want to read it out now where he talks about, um, there's a track on there that, uh, he said the hi hat sound wasn't quite right. And Julian Casablanca's was needling him about the hi hat sound. So he was like, all right, uh, fab go in there and hit the crash symbol once. So fab goes in there and hits the crash symbol exactly once. And he, and, and so Gordon Raphael digitally, you know, routes it so that every time the hi-hat hits in this song section, that single crash hit would also hit as an overdub. So it's like, it's so fascinating to me. I love, again, and this goes back to the stuff I was talking about with Wolfpack and the stuff I was talking about with Daptone, where it's just like this stuff that you hear that you initially are like, wow, that sounds like garbage. There's so much thought that goes into it. I love it. Uh, both guitarists played through two 12-inch speaker Fender Hot Rod DeVilles, which became the absolute bog-standard guitar amp you saw everywhere in Brooklyn for the next 20 years. Uh, They played through Jekyll and Hyde overdrives, the Proco Rat distortion pedal, the MXR micro amp. Um, Albert Hammond Jr. played a Fender Strat. Nick Valenci played an Epiphone Rivera. But other than that, their guitar setups were pretty similar, 
I love the guitar sound on this record. Um, they talk about how to build these parts. Neither of them would play uh, complete chords. You know, they talk a lot about how the they were influenced by television, which whenever you hear bands talk about like interlocking guitar parts, they're usually talking about like the, the first television record. And you can see it in live videos. They're both like when they're playing Last Night, which is a song that ostensibly has kind of like the same guitar rhythm for a, through a lot of it. They're playing different voicings of the same chord or they're playing one person will play like a partial voicing on the lower strings and the other person will play a different vo voicing on the higher strings. Um, and what that does is kind of creates the effect of like a pianist playing where one guitarist is playing like the left hand of the piano and the other guitarist is playing like the right hand voicing of the piano. And anchoring all of this is uh, Nikolai Freitscher playing bass. Uh, although I think in this, in the last night, no, in the Someday video, I think he's playing a Rickenbacker bass, but he's playing a Fender Jazz for this recording through the iconic setup of an Ampeg SVT uh, head and an Ampeg 8x10 cab. While we're talking about the the bass on this record, it's fun to note that Julian Casablancas would later said, there are some bass lines on our first album that were 100% ripped off from The Cure. We were worried about putting out the album because we thought we'd get busted. Which I don't think you can copy a bass line because the bass line to I Saw Her Standing There, the Beatles song, is a direct rip of Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You. It's the same bass part. Well, it's funny you say that because I just did some Googling. Well, I saw you put that note in and I was reading from Bass Musician magazine about the Blurred Lines copyright case uh -huh. and about how they brought up the bass lines in those two songs uh -huh. to try and prove copyright infringement and arguing about how the, the feel of the bass lines and the rhythmic anticipation that the way the bass lines were structured were enough to constitute copyright infringement. And one of the lawyers pointed out, no, they're both just kind of doing the um, the Curtis Mayfield uh Superfly. They're both just doing the Superfly bass line. Um, um, oh, yeah. Boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. So the, you, you can copyright bass lines in certain instances when they constitute a melodic feature of the song. Like, you could probably copyright the Come Together bass line because it's such an iconic hook. You could possibly copyright... Um, well, no, I, I don't think you could. And this is where it gets so blurry and this is where it gets so interesting about this horrifying future that we live in where you can litigate this kind of stuff because, like, let's talk about a baseline like Sheik's Good Times. You know, mm. bump, bump, bump. Right, that baseline is also another one bites the dust, right? Bump, bump, bump. That baseline is also in a Lizzo song. But all it is is those three quarter notes and then Wolfpack wrote their own song that's a response to it called Three on E, which is literally just bum, bum, bum. And then you do a variation on that. So there's all these instances of how you can take like something that is a recognized piece of musical common language and put a twist on it, but you might not be able to copyright it exactly. Something like Green Day's Long View is really interesting because that's such an iconic bass hook. But that's such a common way of navigating those chord shapes that if you got a really good lawyer who is maybe also a bassist, he could just say, there's no way you can copyright that as a bass line because it's just outlining a chord a specific way. One of the things I was reading about that's really interesting with this, the Blurred Lines case, is that the lawyer in that case uh, is this guy, Howard King, and he actually represented ZZ Top when John Lee Hooker sued them over the song LaGrange, which is the John Lee Hooker pattern. And in that case, ZZ Top won that case by successfully saying, oh, this is like a blues it rhythmic idiom. Like you can't copyright that rhythmic feel. Decades later, this guy is now representing uh, def he's defending Robin Thicke and Pharrell. So, I don't know. Music copyright is so fascinating to me. Well, wasn't that that Blurred Lines lawsuit? Wasn't the argument from the uh, the Marvin Gaye side basically you you stole the the groove and the spirit of the song? You stole the feel, the vibe, yeah, the, feel, the vibe yes. of the song, yeah. So, and that's why, thankfully, they lost because if you start copywriting vibes, like you're just f yeah. everybody's, f you know. 
Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. And it all comes down to ultimately anybody who's trying to comment on this from any kind of expert position, you know what it comes down to? The judge. <laughs> it was a what most recently won. Yeah, what the yeah. judge most recently decided. Where did um Vanilla Iceland on uh, Ice Ice Baby versus um Under Pressure? That's a great question. Uh, it was settled out of court. Ah, uh, and then okay. and then after the fact, Bowie and Queen were given credit for the sample. Okay. Yeah. He wised up. <laughs> he yeah. Just, he, yeah. Wasn't he the one that was dangled out of a balcony by his ankles? By point. um, yeah, by uh, Suge, but that was over something else. Uh. But he's the one who he's he became like the you know the big public face of it because he gave that idiotic interview <laughs> where he was like, he See, was like there's, different. Yeah, he, he was like there's goes ding 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 digga ding ding, and ours goes ding 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 digga ding 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 digga ding ding. It's different. It's different, and everyone, right? And was, yeah, and it was like we're gonna laugh you out of the music industry. <laughs> but speaking of people that the Strokes ripped off, yes. Jordan. The bands knew that last night sounds like Tom Petty's American Girl. Julian Casablanca said in a 2003 Spin interview, people would say, you know that song American Girl by Tom Petty? Don't you think last night sounds a little like that? And I'd be like, yeah, we ripped it off. Where you been? <laughs> <laughs> and in the same interview, he copped to stealing his phrasing in the Room on Fire single 1251 from Kim Gordon singing in the Sonic Youth song Bull in the Heather. At least, at least he's honest. Yeah, and Tom Petty, he's sort of a frequent source of uh, theft for musicians. Uh, <laughs> in addition to the strokes with American Girl, there's the Red Hot Chili Peppers stealing, uh, ganking, as you wrote, uh, <laughs> Last Chance with Mary Jane, the guitar part, which they then borrowed for Danny California. Egregious. The worst one. Not just because I hate that band, but holy sh do they sound the same. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? I actually don't know if I do. Oh my god. I'm not I mean, a huge Tom Petty guy. Oh, well, f you. <laughs> Despite his penchant for Rickenbackers. Okay, well, all right. Go ahead. Do read the last part. And then, of course, the, the biggest one that I remember most recently is uh, the suspicious similarity between Won't Back Down and Sam Smith's Stay With Me. Stay with me and I won't back down. So this is Last Dance with Mary Jane. And this is Danny California. They just made it dumber. <laughs> they just jack. They made it broier. Oh, we talked about uh, Sublime's "What I Got" versus Lady Madonna. Yeah. Admittedly, this shit must have been so much more complicated when they didn't have like all of recorded music at their fingertips. But some of that stuff is like because the whole thing in in copyright court is that you have to prove that you've never heard the song, right? right and I'm yeah. like, there's no way in God's green earth that the four straight white men in Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> had never heard "Last Dance with Mary Jane" when they wrote that. Like, I'm sorry, you you guys heard that fucking song. Sam Smith, I buy a little bit more because he they're British and they, there's more plausible deniability there but like anyway though petty was cool with it <laughs> yeah he gave a quote in rolling stone in 2006 saying the strokes took american girl for last night there was an interview that took place with them where they actually admitted it that made me laugh out loud i was <laughs> like okay good for you it doesn't bother me bless him <laughs> yeah be chill about it we're gonna take a quick break but we'll be right back with more Too Much Information in just a moment.
Another great thing that I love about Is This It is the vocal sounds, which are just a huge touchstone for kind of a lot of indie going forward, indie vocal sounds going forward. Um, just the lo fi ness of it and grit. And they got that either just by pushing a mic, an Audio Technica 4033A, very hard through an Avalon 737 tube preamp, or by using a $1,200 Neumann TLM 103 on a PV keyboard amp, a tiny PV keyboard amp with an 8-inch speaker that Julian Casablanca used for all of his home demos. He brought it into the studio and was like, yeah, mic this. Um, and that's where you get the really out of control, like, <laughs> kind of stuff. Love it. Great, great vocal sounds. Raphael, one of my other favorite quotes about the recording process of this album is Gordon Raphael talking to The Guardian. He says, Julian had so many ideas and a freakishly controlled concept of rhythm and timing. Even when he drunk 13 beers and was asleep on the couch, one eye would open and he'd go, the hi-hat's not right. Uh, one thing that complicated the sessions was that the ink on the band's deal with RCA wasn't dry yet. Uh, they didn't sign fully until a week and a half into their time of Raphael, which meant that they'd already completed stuff by the time that they had officially signed, and the label was not thrilled with what they had. Raphael told Sound on Sound, Having RCA America, a major label, coming to see the Strokes recording in a basement with Gordon Raphael, the untested producer, was a very eye-opening and interesting process. From the get-go, they wanted it out of my hands. They did not like the sound of the EP, The Modern Age. They did not think the album was going to be professional enough. They were very worried. They actually got to hear the new recordings after they signed the piece of paper, and what Julian did was have the A&R guy come down and played him the material on a boombox in the waiting room. Then I watched the A&R guy smile and put his arm around the band members, and he shook my hand and said, good job. But I felt the vibe of... Oh, what are we going to do now? How are we going to get this thing turned around right? I could feel that from the moment that we met. And he elaborated on that vibe in an interview with Pitchfork, explaining that at one point, RCA's Steve Rab Rablowski, sorry, Steve, uh, he heard what the band had been up to. And then Strokes manager Ryan Gentles called Gordon Raphael and said that this guy, Steve Rablowski, told Ryan Gentles, here's a list of producers that if you switch from working with Gordon Raphael, RCA will cover the cost of that that went over budget. In effect, they would pay the band to start working with different producers. Um, and he he was mixing this as he kind of went, but then when they got to the mastering stage, they had one more hurdle. Uh, mastering for the layman is the final step of the recording process. It's where you get the mix tracks and you basically finalize everything for an album and you make sure everything sounds consistent everything's eq'd a certain way to sound like it's all of a piece uh it is the the final hurdle to clear in any recording process uh and gordon Raphael told pitchfork when we finished is this it we had to go to sterling mastering labs to master hard to explain the song and the b-side for the first single release i pushed play and to my surprise my little eight track basement computer recording sounded stunning at that moment, RCA's Steve Rablowski stood up with the head mastering engineer from Sterling and said, Guys, this is some of the most unprofessional sounding music I have ever heard. This is not going to sell, and you are really doing damage to your career by trying to release music that sounds this way. My heart just sank because I had just celebrated the fact that it sounded exactly the way I wanted to. I wanted to cry. Then the mastering guy, Greg Calby, stood up and said, That's right. They're not going to understand your music in Kansas anyway. Why make it more difficult by having that distortion on the voice? Be sensible. I picked up my computer, said I disagreed, and left the building. But there was one trick from the mastering process that did stick, and it's in fact the sound that opens the record. Raphael told Vice, We didn't use tape during the process of making the record, but the engineer at the mastering lab said, Why don't we put it on tape and see if you like what it does? By the second or third song, Julian said, What's that sound? What are you doing? And the engineer said, I'm rewinding the tape. Julian said, why don't you stick that on the first song of the album? That'd be a really interesting way to start the album. So that <laughs> that opens is this it, is the sound of uh, the master tape being rewound before a take that they did not use while they were recording. <laughs> it only came in at the mastering step. 
And now we've got to talk about the cover art of This Is It. There are two main covers for it. The one that was released everywhere but the United States was a photograph by Colin Lane of his then-girlfriend's leather-gloved hand resting on her, as you Heigl wrote, derriere and hip. Colin Lane told The Guardian that it was late 1999 or 2000, and he had a Polaroid big shot with 10 photos in it that he wanted to use. His girlfriend was getting out of the shower, and they had a Chanel glove left over from a previous shoot, and the result was that very arresting black-and-white photo. Lane said he met the Strokes in January 2001 on assignment from Face Magazine and hit it off with them after photographing them on the roof of the Lincoln Building in Midtown, New York. And as he explained to The Guardian, a few weeks after they signed with RCA, they invited me to hang out and shoot a few shots around the city. So we piled into an old Winnebago and their art director called to hassle them about choosing an album cover. They were flying out to Australia the following day and the deadline was approaching. Luckily, I'd brought my portfolio with me and they asked if they could flick through. When they asked... <laughs> I love this. When they asked if they could use the ass shot, I couldn't believe it. It's an all-time quote right there. <laughs> However, for the American version of This Is It that was released in October 2001, the cover art of This Is It was changed to a different photograph. This is the one I know, and chances are, if you're listening to this, the one you probably know, too. It's a photograph of subatomic particles tracking in a bubble chamber. And this, I didn't realize this, the same image appears on the cover of The Scientist as Rebel, by theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson. And a portion of this image also appeared on Prince's 1990 album, Graffiti Bridge. So that's quite a history for that image. RCA product manager Dave Gottlieb commented the replacement was, quote, straight up a band decision, while manager Ryan Gentle said that Julian Casablancas had phoned him just before the Japanese and European versions were released and said, I found something even cooler than the ass picture. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the Strokes 2003 biography by Martin Roach mentions that the fear of objections from America's more conservative retail industry, like, you know, your Walmarts, was a major factor in the artwork's alteration. But uh, photographer Colin Lane, he backed the story of Julian changing his mind. He told GQ in 2019, Julian fell in love with this new image of the subatomic particles and liked it more than my ass shot. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for me, though, my photograph was already in the printing presses, and I guess they'd already printed a ton of albums. So RCA told Julian they could have the other cover with the Adams for North America, but it was too late for the rest of the world. Yeah, I always assumed that that was a conscious choice. Like, okay, America's not going to really want this uh, sort of BDSM-style album cover, so let's just go for something a little more abstract. I love both of them. I thought the yeah. first one was... Um... And I never was it. Some I I read somebody called it a tribute to Spinal Tap, but I wasn't. Oh wow! Couldn't couldn't pin that down. But oh, the uh, sniff the glove or yeah. smell the glove or whatever. Yeah, I always thought it looked like a Helmut Newton. Yeah, photo, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I love the the subatomic particle shot. Um, the the bigger problem for is this its release was as with a lot of things, nine eleven. <laughs> the record had originally been released in July of two thousand one in Australia and August of 2001 in the UK, remember, not yet two years after the band played their first show. Uh, and while it was originally slated for September 25th, 2001 in the States, the release was pushed back over the song New York City Cops, which memorably features the chorus, New York City Cops, they ain't too smart. Dave Gottlieb, the former VP of marketing at RCA, told Lizzie Goodman, I remember an email coming in from somebody who worked with retail and he had written this paragraph about how he had put the strokes record on and it got to New York city cops and it made him angry because he was looking out of his window and seeing the ashes of the twin towers and this song made him take the CD out and throw it away. So out of a desire to not be insensitive, the band pulled the song from the CD release in the States, although the vinyl had been pressed and had actually come out on September 11th with that song intact. This was on vinyl? I, think, I feel like 2001 was like the era way before it got cool again to have stuff out on vinyl. I, yeah, I don't Although know. Although the Strokes would, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I think it might have come down to them, their their personal preference. Um, is This It was an immediate critical favorite. Joe Levy of Rolling Stone called it the stuff of which legends are made in eerily accurate review. NME reviewer John Robinson called it one of the best debut LPs by a guitar band during the last 20 years. In a Perfect 10 review, it was named the best album of 2001 by Billboard, CMJ, Entertainment Weekly, NME, Play Ladder, and Time, while Magnet, Q, and The New Yorker notched it highly in other end-of-year best album lists. 
Mojo, New York Times, Rolling Stone, USA Today, the list goes on and on. It was number two behind Bob Dylan's Love and Theft at, uh, I think, the Paz and Jop Review, uh, which is the the, the uh, uh, yearly Village Voice, Village Voice uh, survey of critics, music critics, reviews. Uh, and it was named Best Album of the, of the Year at the NME Awards and Best International Albums at the Meteor Music Awards. As you probably gathered, the press loved the Strokes. And what's not to love? They were young, they were good-looking, and in a rock-oriented music critic world, sick of new metal and not yet adjusted to hip-hop's commercial dominance, the Strokes were seen as saviors. Rolling Stone and Spin fawned all over them, as did the British press. And once the band's touring schedule caught up with the coverage, they really did set down the blueprint for the so-called rock renaissance of the time, the rising tide of which lifted the White Stripes, Interpol, and Kings of Leon, along with also rands like The Vines and The Hives. And I remember this reading music press around this time as a you know high school kid wanted to know more about guitar bands. Around this era, every single band became The Blank Strokes, Kings of Leon were the Southern Strokes. Vampire Weekend were the Ivy League Strokes. The Killers were the Vegas Strokes. Yeah. Other, uh, who 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 else was another stroke? I guess that was kind of it. We kind of ran through all of them. Interpol were just like the goth strokes. Interpol were the goth strokes. But yeah, I'm trying to figure out if, uh, yeah, White Stripes stood on their own, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. They're Jack- the incestual strokes. <laughs> <laughs> the incest the incest strokes. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Strokes drummer Fab Moretti briefly dated Drew Barrymore, which is weird. She has an interesting dating history. Got uh, Tom Green, guy from the Strokes, Justin Long, maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. What, what I think it's David incredible... Cross. I think David Cross. He really? Was in... No, no, no. She didn't date him. Oh. He he they he opened for them at I think Irving Plaza at one point. And I think it may be in the bathroom. I think it's him who was like, yeah. I knew Fab was going to get his heart broken by Drew, and I just didn't say anything. But they dated for like five years. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Courtney Love also came into the band's orbit and wrote a song called Julian, But I'm a Bit Older Than You. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, this is the point at which the behind the music narrator's voice would turn grave as he began describing the downward slope of the band's fame. All of their drinking would catch up with them on their European tour, and Albert Hammond Jr.'s drug use also started spiraling out of control. A lot of people blame Ryan Adams. Uh, he's the basically the villain of Meet Me in the Bathroom. Would you like to explain Ryan Adams' influence on the New York rock scene at this time? Oh, boy. Well, Ryan Gentles also managed Ryan Adams, but yeah, there's a lot of people who make a lot of... They basically say that Ryan was just a terrible influence on anyone he came in contact with. Um... You know, not just for drinking, but also drugs. I mean, the the guy was uh, basically some people have made the assertion that he got Albert Hammond Jr. hooked on heroin, uh, which is pretty heavy. Um, but anyway. Oh, I neglected to mention that Julian Casablancas also punched an RCA executive in the face because he didn't want to perform in front of a live audience. Who among us? Rock and roll. <laughs> uh, what's most interesting to me in the review mirror about the strokes and is this it is the sense that uh the record didn't do that well like given all of these people interviewed given all the people who talk about it in my personal life david long shout out college (laughs) roommate one of my best friends this is one of his favorite records it took five years for this to sell uh over six hundred thousand copies in the uk which is not that much in a pre-downloading super pre-digital world it took that same amount of time for this to even get over a million units in the U.S. Um, put that in perspective, the band had already released another two full-length records before Is This It went platinum. Um, this is for a major label band. I think our RCA signed them for five albums. Um, according to the somewhat dubious site bestsellingalbums.org, Is This It has now sold 1.7 million copies, which is like... I don't know, in modern eras, that's like one Adele Records first month, right? Something like that. And I bet you the 700,000 that it's cleared in the last like 15 years are all on vinyl from like Urban Outfitters. Yeah. Somewhat depressingly, while I was researching this, I learned that uh, Julian Casablanca sold his own stake in the Strokes catalog last year to a publishing company. 
Already? It's way too early for that kind of move. Yeah. Uh, J.P. Bowersock, the band's guitar teacher, who is credited in the liner notes for the first two records as Guru, which I love, huh. uh, told Pitchfork that he thinks the music industry's contraction in the wake of the initial wave of digital downloading may have been to blame for the Strokes perceived failure to capitalize on their hype. He said when the music industry goes into that kind of period, where do you think they're going to put their money? On an up-and-comer or the new R. Kelly record? Ooh. Ooh. When times are tough and profits are down, you focus on the money makers, and moving less than a million units is not a money maker. Not helping was the fact that the band was obstinate about a lot of stuff to the consternation of the people in their orbit. They turned down $600,000 for Heineken to use uh, either last night or someday in an ad. They refused to play the 2002 MTV Video Music Awards because the network insisted on having them share the stage with the Hives and the Vines. The pitch was that each band would get a minute and a half to play. Uh, Ryan Gentles told Pitchfork, at the time, no one said no to the MTV VMAs. The producers actually made me get Julian on the phone to explain why he would not play on the stage with those bands. It's nothing against them, he said. I don't think we're in the same genre, and I'm not going to do a band off with them. That was pretty much the last time we were played on MTV. I didn't realize until researching this episode that the two main Strokes videos, and probably more, the one for Last Night and Someday, were directed by Roman Coppola, Francis' son and Sophia's brother. Hmm. That's it. That's it. It's like that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, writer Andy Greenwald told Lizzie Goodman for Meet Me in the Bathroom, the Strokes really weren't that big. Everyone needed them to be big and desperately wanted them to be big, but they kind of weren't. <laughs> and Moby, who was in the band's New York City orbit, also added, the Strokes never sold that many records, but they made really good records. The reach, the awareness of them was so much greater than the record sales. Again, like you said earlier in this episode, it's the Brian Eno quote about the Velvet Underground. They may have sold only a thousand records for their debut, but each of the thousand people that bought their debut record went and formed a band or something else that was equally hugely influential. So uh, the Strokes also fell victim to the classic sophomore album Morass. The band, of course, had their entire lives to come up with material for their first album, and then about a year, maybe two tops, to come up with something that would at least equal, if not better it, all while being on the promotional hamster wheel of touring and doing interviews and all sorts of not especially inspiring things. Uh, so, although you actually like their sophomore album, Room on Fire. Room on Fire goes, uh, and it's worth noting that they're the, I think their third, their second biggest sandwiched in between last night and someday on spotify is reptilia which is the song from guitar mm. hero that has like some of their best guitar work uh sorry i'm actually arguing with david long right now on instagram oh what do uh, you do or what'd you do no <laughs> he was just saying that they're more relevant now than they were since the 2000s because uh billy eilish i guess i guess their most recent record one album of the rock rock of the year rock Something of the year. Rock of the Ages? Rock of the Ages. That's an interesting point. So I'm still fighting with him. I'm very interested in this. Well, he's saying that like this this record, The New Abnormal, that came out in 2020, I get it's the it has their top streamed thing, their top stream single is from that on Spotify. But I was like, I'm sorry, there's no way. I'm just saying they never topped Is This It? And he's arguing with me. And he's wrong. Uh, what was I going to say? Former A&R executive Brian Long told Lizzie Goodman, I remember when their second record came out. We really liked them and we were championing them, but we were all wondering if they could develop in a way that would make an interesting career. The analogy we used to make was, will they end up making a London calling? Could they be that? Or is it going to be just cutting different colors from the same swath of fabric? And that's kind of like what happened. There's this common knock that the band's sophomore record, Room on Fire, was Is This It version 1.5. Great record. But the band was also disintegrating internally for the sadly common reasons of drugs, alcohol, and ego. In a 2014 GQ profile, Julian Casablanca said, A band is a great way to destroy a friendship, and a tour is a great way to destroy a band. Oof. Hang on. I've been apparently getting into a debate about the strokes on Instagram DMs. It's also a great way to destroy a friendship. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David, David's wrong. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, Jack White gave an interesting quote about all this to Lizzie Goodman. He said, sometimes being thrust out there pushes you to hurry up and figure yourself out and do away with years of fumbling. That happened to the Strokes. They had to get it together fast. 
Meg White and I had three albums out and an almost too realistic view that nobody was ever going to care about our music. We were assuming that we had a life of playing in bars for 30 people in our future. The extra time to get our things together was good for us mentally. All of that said, by the time the band got to their third record, First Impressions of Earth, they had switched producers away from Gordon Raphael. He told Pitchfork, I believe they saw all the bands that came in the door behind the first record that were selling three times more than them and were wondering if it was a production thing. At the time, they were getting married and having children and wondering how they could go higher than they did. That record was made in various fits and starts in assorted stages of isolation from one another. Most people agree that it is an uneven record with a lot of good songs that can sound like they came across from a different band. After touring on it, the band deliberately didn't make any follow-up plans after First Impressions and went on something of a hiatus, and then they would take five full years for a follow-up, Angles, during which time everyone went their separate ways, Julian started The Voids, everyone recorded solo albums, etc. and etc. But ultimately, none of that can take away from Is This It. In 2009, NME named it as the greatest album of the decade. It placed second on a similar list compiled by Rolling Stone. Two songs of it featured on their 100 best song of the 2000s list. In January 2011, Rolling Stone conducted a survey among their Facebook fans to determine the top 10 debut albums of all time. Is This It came in at number 10 as the most contemporaneous entry on the list behind Pearl Jam's 1991 debut, which I think speaks volumes. Uh, And as like Casablanca's beloved Velvet Underground, the record's greatest influence lies with other musicians. Fellow New York City aughts icon LCD sound system founder James Murphy called Is This It My Record of the Decade. And Brandon Flowers of The Killers said it was so perfect that it depressed him when he first heard it. Alex Turner of the Arctic Monkeys put his love of the record into song, singing I Just Wanted to Be One of the Strokes in their 2018 song Star Treatment. Meanwhile, Lizzie Goodman in Meet Me in the Bathroom wrote Almost every artist I interviewed for this book from all over the world said it was the strokes that opened the door for them. Another musician named Ian Devaney summed up Is This It's Appeal for the Grammys website. Their music just makes it so much easier to put up with everything about living in New York that is irritating and tedious. People still move to New York from very pleasant places that are very far and away specifically to place themselves inside the world that exists in these songs. Play a song from Is This It in a crowded dive bar late at night and people lose their minds. It's the apex of their notion of what New York life would be. (laughs) I'm surprised I made it through that without crying. I know. Great record. Great band. Okay, city. (laughs) (laughs) Folks, thank you for listening. This has been Too Much Information. I'm Alex Seigel. And I'm Jordan Runtog. We'll catch you next time. Too Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The show's supervising producer is Michael Alder June. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 